Previously in this class, we've discussed Anthony Van Dyke and Hans Holbein the Younger, who both served as official court painters for Charles I and Henry VIII, respectively. We've also talked about Joshua Reynolds, who had the begrudging support of George III and only very late in his career. After Charles I and before George III, came George I and George II, uh, who had a total lack of interest in the visual arts. This period created a vacuum at the center of artistic life. George II's oldest son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, employed artists of the Rococo avant-garde at this moment. He, unlike his father, was an avid collector, connoisseur, and patron of art. But his untimely death in 1751 was a disaster for the arts in England. Reynolds was in Italy when Frederick died, returning in 1753, as you remember, with a new classically inspired program for revivifying British portraiture. But on his return, he had no patron to promote his art. A more stable center of patronage was needed, and the artists of the day sought public display, a means of public display. They wanted to imitate the French system, the French uh, Academy for the Arts, and especially the French Salon, which was uh, usually a biannual every two years, um, big public exhibition for uh, art in the 18th century. It actually began in the 17th century. So in April 1760, a few months before the death of George II and the accession of his 22-year-old grandson, George III, to the throne, the first exhibition of the Incorporated Society of the Artists in Great Britain was held. The institutional successor to the Incorporated Society of Artists in Great Britain was the Royal Academy, and this is what this institution is known as even today was founded in 1768 and built on Sir Joshua Reynolds' foundations and effectively replaced the court as the center of patronage of the arts and the arbiter of taste. So again, in that uh, vacuum of art support um, in the mid 18th century, this institution emerged um, to do that work. The Royal Academy exhibitions were both a marketplace and a showcase. And for over 50 years, the genre of portraiture really predominated people's interests. Um, and here you see an engraving of one of these Royal Academy exhibitions, in this case in 1787. Um, and this records just how crowded and popular these exhibitions were and how different they look than many art exhibitions today, right? We're used to the uh, white cube galleries, right? Um, these sort of uh, evacuated spaces where you look at one artwork at a time um, on the walls. But this is very different, and, and I hope you can see um, Martini, the artist here, uh, recording uh, the predominance of portraiture on these walls. Sir Joshua Reynolds regularly exhibited the finest of his portraits at the Royal Academy exhibitions, and these exhibitions were a way in, by which the artist remained in the public eye and underpinned their successful careers. This is how you would get uh, patronage and support. This is a way people could see your paintings. So what do we notice about how the paintings are hung? Um, well, we see some of the full length portraits um, uh, up on the sort of middle, um, the upper middle tiers of the walls. Uh, and this shows you really the impact that Reynolds and Gainsborough, who we're discussing today, would have um, this full length portraiture. You see that this is a cr these walls are crowded, again, in stark contrast to the white cube galleries and museums of today. And so in order to compete for visual attention, artists started using stronger tones and more glaring colors um, to get attention. Thomas Gainsborough 
in fact, lamented in 1766 that there was, quote, a false taste and an impudent style prevailing, which, if Van Dyck was living, would put him out of continence. In other words, uh, he's, he was lamenting the fact that one had to compete visually with these other works and sort of go to um, more extraordinary lengths and that such a fine artist like Van Dyck would get lost in this crowd. Nonetheless, only a few years later, Gainsborough wrote to a client, this is 1772, quote, I think we could still finish a little higher to a great advantage. I am fired with the thoughts of Mrs. Pulteney's giving me leave to send you to the Royal Exhibition and of making a good portrait for you. So even though artists like Gainsborough would lament the sort of um, program and norms of the Royal Exhibition, uh, this was where it was all happening. This is where you made uh, your reputation as an artist. Here's the Pulteney in question. You can see that full-length portraits would get a primacy of place on the walls. Um, and in the previous uh, engraving, uh, it's actually the most important artworks that are higher up on the walls. This might be a little counterintuitive, um, but it's almost like a, a hierarchy. Um, the most important genres and artworks were put um, at the top, and then the lower, less important genres were at the bottom. So members of the gentry or upper echelons of society commissioned portraits to assert their dynastic importance and their importance in local affairs. Portraits like this would often adorn one's country house. Uh, they would serve to display your wealth, right, that you could afford to uh, commission a portrait of this size and from a famous artist. They would commemorate one's public role. Remember, as we discussed last class, women's roles were not public. Uh, so their portraits were often commissioned on the occasion of their marriage and placed them um, outside of public life. Most wealthy people, even if they did not live in London, had their portraits done in the capital, where they were up for parliamentary session or in town for the social season. In the 18th century, the town of Bath in England also had a social season, and sitting for one's portrait was a recognized way of filling the time between the pump room, this was a site for social activity, and a masquerade or a ball that you were to attend. Thomas Gainsborough, uh, the artist at the center of our discussion today, had a studio in Bath for 15 years before moving to London. We learned that Reynolds also had a large studio of assistants who would help him paint his large portrait canvases, working on the sort of less interesting or less important parts of the canvases especially. Reynolds also had a portfolio of prints from which sitters might select a posture that appealed to them. Gainsborough, in contrast, employed only one assistant. He was committed to painting his canvases with his own hands. Anthony Van Dyck's achievements in portraiture were clearly important to Thomas Gainsborough, who painted a full-size copy of this painting, the Lords John and Bernard Stewart. Um, the copy is now it, in St. Louis. Gainsborough made several large-scale copies. He wanted to get the Dutch coloration and elegant paint handling of Van Dyck down. Um, it was that influential to him. And you can imagine, right, it takes a long time to, to create a full-scale copy of another artist's work, but this was um, pretty traditional, a traditional part of a painter's um, education. Van Dyck set a new standard for a host of other painters in society, um, from Reynolds uh, uh, and Gainsborough um, and beyond, Thomas Lawrence, John Singer Sargent. So he had this really um, incredible uh, impact on British portraiture, which is why we discussed him um, early on in this class. 
so here we're seeing Lord John Stuart and his brother Lord Bernard Stuart in 1638 at Van Dyke's hand these were brothers of the Duke Sir Richmond and Lord Lord George Stuart who also sat for Van Dyke both young men fell on the royalist side of the Civil War that was happening at this moment in the 17th century the two brothers were granted leave to make a three-year tour of the continent, their grand tour, in 1639, and may have sat for Van Dyck shortly before their departure. The simple background sets off the two young men's aquiline, really delicate aristocratic features, um, emphasizing their confident poses and rich clothing. Again, that sort of the silky blue especially is something that Van Dyck would be known for. And this is uh, an important example of Van Dyck's construction of a friendship portrait. These two men are showing their affinity, though they're not looking at each other and are dressed quite differently. Their bodies, their gestures are doing a lot of this work. They're facing each other and they're similarly stylish. Um, so we can sort of group them together. Um, and I won't describe it, but I'd like you to just take a moment and look at the sort of um, careful choreography of hands and legs and feet that really intertwine these two figures together and show their relationship. Under the influence of Anthony Van Dyke and in this new marketplace of ideas and art that was the Royal Exhibition, Portraiture took on a renewed authority and importance in the hands of Reynolds and Gainsborough. Here you see Thomas Gainsborough's The Morning Walk, Mr. and Mrs. William Hallett from 1785. And remember that Gainsborough became Joshua Reynolds' number one rival for the elite clientele for portraits in London. His paintings are different. His style is different than Reynolds. Gainsborough shows us much looser brushstrokes. He resists the control of Reynolds's teaching, of Reynolds's dedication to master paintings and uh, a more classical approach. Look, for instance, at uh, the wigs um, of the two uh, the two sitters here. They become um, almost unresolved. Uh, with the landscape behind them, especially um, Mrs. Hallett's wig. It doesn't blend in necessarily with the greenery behind it, but it has the same kind of looseness and wildness um, as uh, Gainsborough's description of the leaves behind her. Again, we always want to watch for the wigs here. Now, it's important to pay attention to the landscapes here um, as representations of nature. The concept of nature in the 1780s was being defined by uh, Rousseau, um, the philosopher who believed that man is not wholly a reasonable, rational being. Um, this kind of thought was reinforced by other American and French thinkers. And there was this uh, thought that um, human nature was not wholly subject to control or order, but had this sort of undercurrent of wildness. So we see this in that sort of shared looseness um, in the description of human figures and uh, the landscape, which isn't wholly wild or out of control, but it's certainly not manicured, right, or subject to uh, man-made rationality. So this is a portrait that was made for a commission. So what do we think the sitters wanted their portrait to say about them? So this leads to a sort of broader question. What is portraiture for anyway, right? What can it do? What, can it, what kind of work can it do for its sitters? What can portraiture do? Well, it can describe allegiances. It can share the values of its sitters. It can do a lot of work to construct one's personality for a public audience and to assert one's social position. Here I'm showing you Gainsborough's The Morning Walk, uh, a portrait of a couple paired with um, a 
painting from the Northern European Re Renaissance, um, the very famous Jean Van Eyck's double portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife from 1434. You may have seen this in art history surveys before. Arnolfini's, uh, the so-called Arnolfini wedding portrait um, was made for domestic use. Um, it was a wedding, uh, commemorating a wedding between two important families, um, those between Italian foreigners and uh, merchants. Van Eyck's painting is an oil on panel. Um, it was meant to uh, go in a home, so this was not a painting for public use or religious use or state use, right? It wouldn't have been destined for um, the inside of a palace or a church or a state building, but a domestic space. Um, that's meaningful. And Van Eyck's painting is famous for being a real textural feast. Um, these two merchants celebrating their uh, a, a wedding um, the material world is important, right, to the world of merchants um, and to Northern European painting at this period. So they wanted to emphasize their material wealth um, through um, details in this painting, through the um, fur lining on the groom's coat, um, that incredible uh, convex mirror um, in the center background, right? Mirrors were extremely expensive. Um, in the 1400s. Um, look at the uh, chandelier above them. Um, look at the beautiful fabrics, um, the hint of an extremely expensive rug on the floor. Um, so that's doing a lot of work and it's much easier, right, to, um, to create these kind of uh, luxury objects in a painting than to own them in your home. So they sort of stood in um, for those objects. Even the oranges on the windowsill and cabinet behind the groom, um, those are uh, signals of wealth uh, that you could have in your home year round with this painting. Van Eyck's painting is also full of symbols um, that communicate specific iconographic meaning. Giovanni, the man, stands next to a window, so showing him closer to the outside world, right, the public realm, while his bride uh, stands next to a broom and a bed, right, she's in charge of domestic care, we're to understand. A dog stands between them. Dogs are very typically symbols of fidelity, right, loyalty in the Western um, tradition. And uh, next to the statue of, or next to the marriage bed, we see a statue of Mary Magdalene, um, a patron saint who would watch over births. Uh, this woman is represented, right, padding a sort of enormous uh, a swath of fabric around her belly, but she's not pregnant yet. It was the fashion at this moment to sort of show your potential fertility um, your role for fertility through fashion. Again, that back mirror, there's been a lot of ink spilled about the function and importance of that convex mirror in the background. Um, the illustration is sustained as you move closer and closer to this fairly small oil painting. Um, you can actually see objects um, uh, reproduced with um, convincing perspective, even with this convex shape. So it's a real um, technical uh, display of the artist's technical skills. Um, and it actually reflects the artist back to the viewer, showing the artist as a witness to this event. So this portrait's doing a lot of work for this merchant family. It's showing off the wealth um, and their uh, etiquette in this sort of formal pose. Um, it's commemorating a uh, sacrament, a wedding. It's giving dignity to um, this couple. So it's really showing material wealth and the social well-being, the social standing of this couple. How is Thomas Gainsborough's uh, The Morning Walk doing similar work then? 
if, especially if um, the Arnold Feeney portrait is the kind of uh, standard or an important model for um, wedding portraits in the Western painting tradition. Well, the couple we see, William Hallett and Elizabeth Steffen, uh, are both aged 21 in Gainsborough's portrait and were due to be married in the summer of 1785. This is a portrait of two wealthy sitters posed in a natural setting, dressed up in their finest clothes, uh, not necessarily their most practical clothes for walking in nature. Um, and clothes, of course, are uh, a popular status symbol for portraiture. Um, this is still true today and true in some of, um, you know, even the selfies you took at the beginning of this class. William is in a black silk, velvet frock suit. Um, his apparent carelessness of his pose, right, he's not posed sort of stiffly and formally as Giovanni Arnolfini is, um, but that's a very studied pose in um, supposed um, casualness or carelessness. Um, his jacket is undone just so. He has one hand tucked um, into his jacket. Um, this is a very fashionable stance for many 18th century portraits uh, to make them look informal when, of course, they were carefully posed and required uh, multiple sittings. Elizabeth, his bride, is in a dress of ivory silk, perhaps her wedding dress, um, which is uh, tied at the waist with a black silk band emphasizing that waistline. A frilled muslin kerchief covers her breast um, with a knot of grape green ribbon under it. Again, just the, the height of fashion here. And unlike Van Eyck or uh, Hans Holbein, you see Gainsborough really show off his paint handling, um, the ease at which he puts uh, pigment down on canvas. Um, and uh, so emphasizing the skill of the artist as one of the uh, the values of owning uh, something like this, just as Van Eyck communicated his skill through that convex mirror. We've moved a bit closer in on the morning walk here to uh, examine as best we can in this digital format, the paint handling of Gainsborough. Gainsborough refuses Reynolds's idea of an elevated portrait. There's no layering of identities here, no secret um, references to the Apollo Belvedere or uh, goddess identities. Um, and his technique is very different too. Um, it was often called, uh, sometimes derisively, hatching, right? You can see the kind of um, hatched brush strokes, um, one by one lined up next to each other. Uh, this was considered by some to look somewhat unfinished in the late 18th century. Again, uh, almost 100 years, maybe 80 years, uh, 90 years before French Impressionism came about and this loose visible brushwork was much more um, accepted, um, although it wasn't in its beginning days. So these sort of, this unfinished brushwork, these scratches and marks, people called them, um, was fairly unique to Gainsborough at this moment. It matched uh, the oil sketching technique, where artists would make rapid marks with fine brushes on a canvas, sketching out compositions and uh, color blocking before going in and uh, making a surface uh, finished and glassy. Uh, for Gainsborough, though, uh, as a finished technique, it gives his figures um, the quality of an immaterial lightness. His figures look elegant, right? They're shown with more soft coloring than Reynolds. Think about those Reynolds figures, right, um, in that dramatic chiaroscuro walking uh, along a shore um, in front of a storm. Instead, Gainsborough's figures have these soft, attenuated curves and don't clash with the landscape, right, um, but sort of blend into it. 
Gainsborough also seeks to capture the fleeting expressions of his figures to, to make them vivid and lifelike. Um, so again, not drawing from the tradition of the uh, classical marble sculpture, but instead um, giving something like uh, the vivid softness of life. And nature, once again, is important here. The trees feel like they're living in front of you, that you can have a sense of air flowing through them, a liveliness of movement um, in those branches. Also, imagining uh, these paintings being hung publicly before going to the homes of the family that commissioned them, the impact is different, right? Um, you could not appreciate details like the reflection in the round mirror in Van Eyck's domestic artwork, but instead audiences would see from a distance, right, looking up at the high walls of the Royal Exhibition, the kind of general sensibility, the sense of movement, the sense of liveliness from a distance, and details became less important. This painting is quite an important uh, example of Thomas Gainsborough's uh, portrait practice. Once again, we have a married couple, um, a young squire and his wife. Once again, they're newly married, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews in this case, and this is from 1748 to around 1750. We need to think once again about what work this portrait is doing for the reputation of, these, uh, of this couple. It shows Mr. Andrews um, holding a hunting rifle um, Mrs. Andrews is on a bench um, to his left on an iron uh, bench seated. Beyond them and to the right stretches their fertile farmland. There's an emphasis here on the neatly gathered sheaves of wheat and the stubble of a wheat field um, at right. The couple on the left, um, by showing their farmland, um, in its detail and in its uh, vastness and enormity, it shows the magnitude of their land ownership. Um, and this is the proprietary claim that grants them their gentrified status. In other words, in order to be a member of the aristocracy in England, you owned land. Um, so this was uh, part of the class structure um, that was quite rigid in the 18th century. So it shows their identity, it shows what they own here. And this sense of property being so important, right, to your voting rights, to your class status in the 18th century. Um, so property is very important, and the sense of property extends even to Mrs. Andrews. In an unfinished passage on the wife's lap, we can see a sketch of a dead pheasant shot by her husband. Uh, this symbolizes for some art historians that Mrs. Andrews, too, has been, you know, snared in the chase, this kind of hunting language that's often applied to romantic relationships. There's a fenced off area in the middle ground uh, just beyond the arm of the bench that Mrs. Andrews sits on. Um, you can see little sheep grazing in this fenced off area. This is shown to demonstrate that Mr. Andrews exploited uh, an advanced agricultural techniques like crop rotation. So I'm not an agricultural expert. I won't claim to be in this class, but um, there, in the 18th century, um, there were sort of rediscoveries of techniques like crop rotation where you wouldn't just farm wheat on the same plot of land over and over and over again. Um, and it would sort of take out all of the same nutrients from the soil, but you would rotate uh, the function of different plots of land in order to um, replenish those nutrients. So Gainsborough gives us a picture of the rural world as a place of peace and leisure um, and rational organization. This is land and wealth that's being well managed, right? Um, and it shows the owner's capacity to apply um, efficient and modern ends uh, to the land that he owns. So this is um, a testament to Mr. Andrews's smart use of the land. And this justifies his ownership over that land, right? Even in the 18th century, um, 
and especially at this moment, we'll talk about this in a moment, this was a, a time when uh, people were frustrated by uh, the magnitude of land ownership um, by folks like Mr. Andrews. So this is making a case for this very elite um, ownership and management of huge swaths of land. This is like um, describing the smart business acumen of, you know, Jeff Bezos running Amazon. Um, if one thinks that he is smart and a good manager and efficient, then that justifies the vast accumulation of responsibility and wealth that he has. There's no suggestion, however, of how this order and this prosperity on the land is achieved, right? There's no workers or signs of who cut the wheat. Um, it's clear, um, and I want you to look at the spotless shoes of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, that neither Robert or Mary participated in the actual labor of agriculture. Instead, Gainsborough shows that labor as being invisible, right? Andrews, in reality, lived off the fruits of the labor of tenant farmers and hired landless laborers. But the artist represents the protagonist's ability to command the process of labor, um, not engaging in its means. And indeed, with the advance of the enclosure movement in England, and this is enclosure you would uh, write with a capital E, um, this references the diminished number of farms um, and the increasing average size um, of farms at this time. So in other words, um, wealthy landowners were buying up small plots and um, acquiring more uh, bigger plots and more sort of industrialized operations. This is called the enclosure movement. And so this pushed out small farmers who would uh, farm little plots, often just self-sustaining, or little plots that they would sell, you know, um, you know their extra cabbage at fair. Um, and the enclosure movement pushed those people out and uh, forced lar a large segment of the rural population to leave the country and to move to towns like London. So society was really changing and demographics were changing quite dramatically at this moment in British history. The rural society, which was once known for a long ladder of ranks and degrees of wealth, this kind of um, uh, intricate uh, ladder of wealth and status became more sharply divided into uh, landowners and laborers. This was also a period which witnessed this really dramatic reorganization of society. So because of the enclosure movement and other factors in the 17th and 18th centuries, this overwhelmingly rural population um, shifted. Uh, Professional and middle classes, those people who dealt in corn and cattle, the people who processed farm products, um, were the lawyers and notaries with rural businesses, um, artisans and shopkeepers who catered to peasantry and town people, um, uh, had to change, right, as land was reorganized and populations moved. And so the fundamental problem in the 18th century in England was this agrarian problem. The relation between those who cultivated the land and those who owned it, those who produced the wealth and those who accumulated it um, really changed. There was a quasi-feudal structure with a peasant as um, a kind of serf. Um, working a large part of the week on a noble's land, on these large, um, almost industrial scale farms. This was similar in many ways to the chattel slavery system of um, the British colonies, which was the other major institution essential to the European economy. And we'll talk a little bit about that colonial system and enslavement when we talk about Jamaica. So this, this real, this complicated, this sort of dark 
picture of the countryside was not always expressed directly in art, right? Think about who paid for this, these canvases, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. Art was produced um, largely for wealthy patrons who wanted images of order and stability that would legitimize their control, right? I am a smart modern man and I am using my wealth and my land ownership wisely, this painting tells us. And Gainsborough identified his interest with his upper class patrons. He wasn't critical of the people who was, were paying him. His father was a prosperous wool merchant in Sudbury, um, which he eventually represented in Parliament, so he was a local politician. Thomas had even higher pretensions and ambitions. Uh, he wanted to become a gentleman. He studied with the French engraver Hubert Francois Gravelo and the English portraitist Francis Heyman, um, both really admired prestigious um, artists. And he made his name, as you know, painting portraits of really fashionable, elite types of people, capturing their rank through these opulent costumes and noble poses. Um, the list of Gainsborough sitters, like Reynolds's, was a list of the who's who of the English nobility. In 1755, Gainsborough painted a pair of landscapes to decorate the country seat of the Duke of Bedford, one of England's great landed aristocrats. He ran an army of tenant farmers, like Mr. Andrews, uh, an army of laborers, servants, gamekeepers. On the right, we see Gainsborough's landscape with a woodcutter and a milkmaid from 1755, from this pair of landscapes for the Duke of Bedford. Here we see the artist actually representing the rural laborers that were invisible or absent in the portrait of Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. But these, this is a really idyllic version of rural labor. You can see the focal point of this painting is a pair, the woodcutter and the milkmaid, who pause, who are resting from their tasks to indulge in a kind of harmless flirtation. There's also uh, a plowman in the middle ground, a kind of uh, virtuous, devoted, concentrated laborer. So uh, he's there in order to provide a kind of moral contrast to the idleness, right, of a couple who are not working. Like the Andrews portrait, uh, the male in this pair stands and the female sits in front of a large tree. But whereas the latter is in a momentary pause in her labor, um, the leisure in the Andrews painting is a permanent way of life, right? Um, as landed, uh, part of the landed gentry, they wouldn't have jobs per se, right, besides managing their houses and their land. Um, in Landscape with a Woodcutter and Milkmaid, the cow forms um, a kind of pictorial movement um, to the plowman and the horses beyond, um, showing that this uh, the scene of both work and rest is a cyclical process, right, in which work is the inevitable end and driving force of life. However, work is not shown as being toilsome or punishing. Um, the plowman in the distance, his action is neutralized by the tree, which obscures his relationship with the plow. So this really mythologizes this world of, you know, merry old England, where all uh, uh, laborers work in harmony, but not too hard, not too arduously, right? They're allowed some rest and flirtation, and they all reap the benefits of this common agricultural industry. In reality, right, and again, Gainsborough is painting from the, with a sympathetic perspective to the elite. In reality, um, poor rural laborers knew little respite from their work. This is not an image of uh, the real conditions of labor, but instead it's been idealized to conceal the realities of the um, tough material existence of living in the countryside. 
real leisure, right, real rest was exclusively reserved for the landed nobility. In the same vein as landscape with woodcutter and milkmaid, we have Gainsborough's The Cottage Door made around 1780, and this canvas was in the Huntington Museum where the blue boy can also be found. This was painted without a commission, so unlike his portrait, and it's a very ple fairly pleasant scene of rural domestic life, um, but it has some sort of underlying currents of anxiety here. Not long after the enclosure movement in England, um, around this time, many families were forced off of the very rural landscape that Gainsborough is painting here, this sort of idyllic agricultural existence. And the current of worry comes from the fact that in this painting, the father is missing. The woman, the mother, is the mainstay of the family. Perhaps they're waiting for the father to return from his day's labor. Um, but the fact is he's missing. And one can read this as showing some anxieties about reordering the family structure as the economic circumstances were changing with the enclosure movement. Um, some fathers went to work in factories before they gave up their country homes. Um, uh, economic anxieties drove families into disrepair, drove people to drink. Um, so Gainsborough is not showing the family as an economic unit here, um, but he does want to emphasize uh, the family's role. He, he's not meaning to be negative. He's emphasizing the family's role as an affective emotional unit. So this is meant to feel idyllic, right? Uh, a kind of ideal vision of living in a country cottage, the kind of nostalgic I ignorance of the actual conditions of extreme poverty uh, rural people would often uh, live under. And remember that, um, that Gainsborough really identified with um, the wealthier classes, um, that aristocratic wealth um, that was being concentrated more and more um, in larger swaths of land. Remember, too, that this is the moment of Rousseau's philosophy and that um, and arguments about, the, about man being an emotional animal, right, rather than an entirely reasonable animal. So we have this sense of nostalgia and sentimentality here. Um, even as we can read some of the anxieties into it. And I should say that it's very common throughout the history of art um, for landscapes, especially kind of nostalgic saccharine landscapes, to emerge at moments when um, it's felt that a kind of way of, of life is disappearing. So we'll see the same thing um, in, Fran in the French context in the next century with um, Impressionist landscapes, and um, the sort of emphasis on um, escape and the rural ideal, the nature as salve to one's industrial present. Um, those kinds of landscapes too were, were made at moments when um, industrial processes were really threatening the kind of wildness and um, independence um, and uh, isolation that um, rural spaces used to offer. So we often see these kinds of uh, sentimental looks um, sort of after the moment has passed, um, nostalgic looks back at, um, you know, merry old England or the old way of life um, in France, moments of escape um, when things have changed um, socially and economically quite dramatically. To conclude, I'll compare for a moment um, these two portraits of women by Gainsborough and Reynolds. The Reynolds um, portrait of Lady Talbot, of course, you're familiar with from last meeting. And here on the left, you have Gainsborough's um, The Honorable Francis Duncombe from 1777. So these are roughly contemporary by two competing artists. So what was each artist offering? What was their brand? Um, why would you sort of commission one over the other? Um, both, uh, we have women 
presented in full-length portraits in front of classical columns. Both portraits were commissioned on the occasion of uh, the marriage of the woman. Um, Gainsborough, uh, in Gainsborough we see more attention to uh, the landscape and the landscape that is quite wild, right? A landscape that feels vivid, that seems to breathe, um, thanks in part to those, um, the hatching, uh, loose style of Gainsborough's brush strokes, right, that seem to sort of vivify or enliven um, the landscape around this woman. Um, we also see uh, Francis Duncombe in uh, a dress that recalls 17th century styles more than contemporary styles. Um, so this dress is reference, referencing Van Dyck, who, of course, you know, Gainsborough admired. Um, uh, but she is shown in the present world. So Gainsborough isn't dating her through this dress, um, but referencing um, an earlier style. So sort of, um, he's not layering identities, um, but um, embedding a, uh, a reference to Van Dyck. Reynolds, on the other hand, of course, we have a classicizing background um, filled with detail. So the landscape isn't doing as much work as that statue of Minerva, as the action of um, uh, using oil to enact a sacrifice to um, the Greek gods. We also have Lady Talbot presented um, in a classical dress, something that looks um, like it came from antiquity. Um, and Lady Talbot is not presented as a contemporary woman, um, as Frances is, uh, but as a goddess, as a vestal virgin. So layering her identity um, under the guise of a goddess. We also remember um, that these are products of two different artists. Um, Gainsborough relied less on a workshop of assistance, right? He only had one. Um, but both of them, um, we see women uh, not in military uniform, not in political dress, uh, not engaged in um, intellectual activities or uh, not performing uh, public social roles. Um, these are women right, that are uh, adorning their, uh, their new husbands, their wealth, their um, attributes um, of, you know, uh, kindness and devotion and um, fidelity and virginity, all the, the usual attributes for portraits of women at this moment in history um, are meant to serve um, to elevate the social status of their husbands rather than reveal a kind of public social role um, in themselves. And these two portraits also share, in addition to um, those basics like being full-length portraits, that they were made for, um, uh, commissioned for sitters in the elite classes, right, people who had the money to pay for canvases of this size and importance and quality, um, but they were also made for the Royal Academy, right? Reynolds and Gainsborough were showing their works before they uh, went off to the buyers at the Royal Academy. So many of their strategies, um, and we talked about some of Gainsborough's, were meant to sort of uh, reach through the noise of those crowded exhibition walls um, uh, as advertisement, right, as marketing, and um, to develop reputations. Um, so the color, the size, um, these all became more emphasized um, because of this public exhibition space, which was so crucial um, to understanding painting and especially um, how wildly popular and elevated portrait, portraiture was at this moment in British art history.